。あ、すみません。あの、ちょっとスカイプの使い方にあんまり慣れてない人もたりやってるんで、ろくなことないですね。えっ、ー、と、えー、スカイプでちょっとうまくスクリーンシェアがで今できなかったんで、えー、こちらの方であるファイルを使ってプレゼンテーションしようと思います。えー、始めようと思います。So, we can take this start right now.Okay,、uh, well, good morning.、Uh, happy to.、Uh... You electronically、uh, for this presentation.、Um, I was just in Japan.、Uh, actually, I left Japan on Monday, so I still got a little bit of jet lag from Japan.、Uh, I had a really good time while I was there.、Um, visited b l i n k s c o n Japan,、uh, as well as some Sony business meetings. Anyway, today I would like to talk about the status of embedded Linux and cover some、uh, technical topics having to do with. The kernel,、uh, some of the features that have gone into the kernel, and some of the projects that are going on that I think are interesting to follow the industry. So,、uh, next slide. So, these are kind of the major parts of the talk. I'll be talking about kernel versions and then、uh, go through some technology areas, specific technology areas like boot up time and real time. And then I'll talk about CE workgroup projects, about the status of that.、Uh, some other stuff, miscellaneous things, distributions and technology, and then、uh, give、uh, pointers to some resources. So, next slide. First thing I want to talk about is the kernel versions in the last year. So, let's go to the, that slide. So,、um, <coughs> excuse me. The,、uh, in the last year, we've had five. Kernel versions.、Uh, that's very common these days. We're on a very regular cycle.、Um, I actually was able to predict within two days、uh, the appearance of 3.9. I had predicted April 30th,、um, and、uh, it was actually arrived on April 28th, so I was only two days off.、Uh, we had the 3.9 version of the kernel at the end of April. And we're currently on Linux version 3.10, our release candidate 4,、uh, as of June 2nd. And I predict, I'm going to make another prediction just、uh, because it's fun,、uh, that the next kernel, next slide, will arrive on July 7th,、uh, 2013. So、uh, that's actually a Sunday. I don't know if that'll happen or not, but I'll probably be only within a few days of that. Um, <clears throat> so, the kernel versions are coming out at very regular intervals.、Um, I did hear that this was a little bit bigger kernel version, kernel release than usual, so it may take a little bit longer to settle down.、Um, I think this is an important one to test.、Uh, there's a lot of new features in this one. We haven't had、uh, a long term stable kernel、uh, for a while, and so there's some pent up demand for that. Uh, so, it's probably worth,、uh, worth looking at this kernel and, and doing as much testing on it as possible before, before it actually gets released to make sure it's as good as possible.、Um, next slide. So, in,、uh, just by way of review,、um, and I, I covered these topics in the last,、um, the last jamboree, I talked about some of these earlier kernels. So, I'll focus most of my time. Talking about the 3.9 and the 3.10 kernels,、uh, which have come out since the last jamboree.、Uh, but just uh, looking uh, back earlier in the year、uh, to Linux 3.5, some of the major features that are interesting for embedded was the kernel log rework. So there's now a new structured print K,、uh, there's a new format that allows you to add tags、uh, to. Uh, the print K. There's a,、uh, so that's, that's interesting. I haven't seen a lot of people using that yet,、uh, but I'm not at the top of tree very much. I've been working an awful lot with、uh, Linux version 3.4, but I haven't, I haven't seen people using this yet, but it is there.、Uh, it's quite possible it's been being rolled out in、uh, desktop distributions where, where a lot of this stuff was、uh, targeted.、Um, Also, in Linux 3.5, support for writing NFC drivers.、Uh, that's uh, very important.、Um, a lot of、uh, mobile devices now have、uh, NFC, near field communication support. 
Um, and uh, it's been in kernels before 3.5, uh, there are NFC capabilities, uh, but the driver framework for NFC was not, was not really very good. Um, and so Linux 3.5 adds some framework support there. Uh, also, in 3.5, integration of RAM oops and pstore. Um, so these are ways to store uh, information, uh, particularly the kernel log, into um, RAM, either RAM area uh, areas or into uh, pstore, which is uh, non-volatile memory. Uh, and part of this is work that is being done to support the Android RAM console. Um, so this is something I've wanted for a long time, is to, the ability to very easily use an existing kernel mechanism uh, to get at the previous kernel instances, uh, OOPS data or print K log data. Uh, and so that's all been mainlined. So that, that will be a pretty nice feature. Um, and then also in Linux 3.5, we have user space probes that went in. Um, and uh, it's a mechanism to support putting uh, probe points or breakpoints up in user space. Um, not breakpoints, there was already support for that through pre-trade, P-trace, but this is more uh, probe points to automatically collect data for tracing systems. Um, and then auto sleep, and I will talk uh, a bit more about auto sleep in the technology area section. So next slide. Um, in Linux 3.6, uh, the Android RAM console functionality, which I talked about before, was, was actually integrated into pStore. So there was further uh, work at integrating Android functionality into the kernel. Uh, if you're in automotive, uh, the CAN protocol is, uh, is very interesting. And uh, in Linux 3.6, CAN FD support was added. Uh, this is uh, basically the CAN bus protocol, except with flexible data rate. So it's a, a new extension to the CAN protocol. And uh, you can go look at the, the source code for that. Um, so uh, I think uh, a lot of automotive products and some other industrial products are also using the CAN protocol. Um, LED uh, supports a one-shot mode. There's a new SysFS interface uh, for certain uh, one-time either LED or GPIO manipulation. So you can program essentially kind of a whole sequence of events to happen in, in one shot. Uh, based on a timer and a trigger. Uh, and that's good for things like, uh, for the vibrate function, if you want to program it all as one go, uh, you can have it set up to turn on and then turn off automatically. So if something happens to the controlling application in the meantime, uh, the end state is already configured into the one-time uh, operation. So it's, uh, it doesn't require that the application stay alive. Uh, to complete, you know, to turn off the vibrator or to turn off the LED. So that's actually very useful to, to save power um, and avoid uh, the hardware getting into weird states. Uh, there's also something called suspend to both. Uh, this is the ability to create a resume image both in RAM and on disk. And this is also has to do with, well, it has to do with robustness in the face of uh, loss of power. So you've always been able to save an image to RAM, and that's called suspend. And then if you save an image to disk, that's normally called uh, hibernate. Um, but uh, the ability to save an image to both is interesting because you have the same image. And uh, what happens is normally you put the image into RAM. And if you're just doing a straight suspend, you put the image into RAM and, uh, and go into a low power mode. But if a person then puts the device on a shelf for a week or two weeks or something, even in low power mode, the RAM has to be refreshed. And you could still lose power and end up uh, losing state. Um, but in this case, if you're using suspend to both, the same image is in both places. And so um, even though you can, uh, if you haven't completely lost power, you can quickly come back, back out, of, out of the RAM image. But if you have completely lost power, once you charge the device again, you can resume from disk uh, with no corruption. So that's a, that's a pretty nice feature uh, for robustness for power management. 
And then in Linux 3.7, we started to see the first uh, instances of ARM multi-platform support. And uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, th this is kind of single Z image support. Also, we saw the first instances of the 64-bit support for ARM. Um, and so that is, I think we're going to see more of that. It's hard to tell right now whether or not uh, this 64-bit ARM is being targeted and embedded. I kind of think it's overkill for embedded, but uh, these things have a way of, uh, of showing up. Uh, all it takes is one product that kind of requires something weird, like more than more than four gig of memory or something, and uh, all of a sudden, 64-bit stuff starts to creep into everything. So but we'll see how that goes. Right now, I think this is mostly targeted at some of the, uh, the ARM's efforts to get their uh, processors into the server space, uh, but it may lead down into embedded. Uh, also, cryptographically signed kernel modules. Uh, so it's possible to uh, sign kernel modules so that they can be trusted by the kernel and ultimately by the user that's uh, running the device. Um, a lot of, there was a lot of, a little bit of controversy uh, with this that uh, people are worried that uh, that, it, that uh, device manufacturers will use this to to prevent people from modifying modules or software on their devices. But it does serve a, a, a useful purpose. It's kind of like uh, any security feature can be used for both good or bad, depending on on who whose security is supporting. Um, but that's actually, it's a nice feature. It's something that we've talked about for years and years, uh, to be able to uh, have a nice chain of trust with regard to modules loaded into the system. Um, uh, there's a command, a new command that's part of the perf suite, uh, which is perf trace. Um, and it's kind of an alternative to strace. Uh, it's great. It's good because it, it so it's right from the user space. You can you can do perf trace on an application or on the whole system, and this is good. It allows intermingling of kernel trace events with syscall events. So um, I've found that uh, this type of thing is very useful to see what's going on in the whole system to see not only the kernel user space transitions, which is what strace uh, gives you but also to see uh, kernel events intermingled, to, to see what's going on within the context of an individual trace and the, the scheduling events and how, how things are flowing through the system. So that should be very useful. Uh, we have uh, runtime power management for audio, so improvements to uh, some of the power management code in the, in, in the kernel. And then uh, the kernel doc system can output in HTML5 output. So uh, some of the built-in documentation inside the kernel uh, is more easily browsable with a, with a web browser. So that should be useful in the future for developers. Now, getting on to uh, 3.8, uh, uh, I think this is very exciting work. This is F2FS, which is the Flash-friendly file system. Uh, there was an article on this um, in uh, LWN.net and Zhu Yang Huang, who is the, the, the creator of this file system, works for Samsung. Uh, Samsung basically created this to take advantage of the characteristics of flash memory. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, it's, it's uh, a new flash file system tuned specifically for block-based flash devices. And again, when, we, when I talk about individual technology areas, I'll, I'll talk more about uh, some of the details. Uh, also, there's a thermal governor system, uh, not just power management, but heat is an important problem in consumer electronics. And there's another, the, the kind of a new system for uh, installing governors for heat control. Um, and then memory control group support for accounting for kernel memory usage. And, and you'll see that this uh, memory control group support uh, gets used later in 3.10 for some other new features are pretty nice. But basically, the basic idea here is uh, inside uh, inside a particular control group, you can set uh, limits, and you can do some accounting for 
uh, stack usage and slab usage. Um, so for kernel memory usage, so this is not just how much do processes use up in user space, um, but how much how much are they using down in actually in the kernel, and you can prevent kind of runaway situations. And then CPU idle support for big dot little, and I'll talk uh, a lot more about big dot little and some of the scheduling things coming up in a little bit. Okay, and then on three point nine. Uh, we had our first, uh, well, not our first, we, uh, we have F-Trace snapshots. Um, and this is, uh, this is very similar to a feature that um, Linux uh, Trace Toolkit had, LTT had, for quite a long time. Uh, they called it um, airplane, now uh, what was it, flight, oh, I can't remember, I can't remember the name they called it, but it was, uh, the ability to capture a snapshot, actually snapshot the system, save off the data without stopping the process. And uh, you could grab the data in flight. The ba basic idea was that you, you left the trace running at all times. Um, and so this is, this is uh, really useful uh, for not interrupting the system. And if you can get your trace overhead low enough, depending on the set of events you have enabled, uh, this this can really be useful to do kind of long running traces and then to take a snapshot as soon as you see some anomaly, uh, some weird behavior that you want to um, look at. Um, another thing which, uh, which I have been resisting for years and years in the embedded space, but it's starting to come, and that's virtualization and embedded uh, in, in, you know, x80, the uh, Intel architecture has virtualization uh, it has been there for years and years, and ARM has virtualization. We, in Linux 3.9, we say that you see the KVM virtualization for the K Cortex A15 processors. I think virtualization will be interesting to see how it's used and embedded. Uh, there are actually some use cases. I've been dead set against it. Embedded um, systems have very, very tight uh, resource constraints, and virtualization seems like one of those overheads that you should avoid if you can at all costs. But there are some use cases, um, particularly, for instance, using mobile phones in a business setting where you might have personal data and you want to keep it completely virtualized and separate from the, kind of the business side of the phone. Um, so there are some interesting use cases for virtualization, and now it's starting to show up in the kernel on ARM. Um, <clears throat> another thing which is kind of very forward looking is uh, support in, in 3.9. Uh, there was support added, at least on the PowerPC platform, for transactional memory. Uh, so there are instructions specifically to work with transactional memory. And um, the way transactional memory works, there's um, it allows you to do some operations without locking. Uh, kind of the hardware takes care of the synchronization of, of memory operations. And so in some cases, uh, this can lead to a, a great simplification. It, it allows you to eliminate the locking and make it transparent to the applications using some of the algorithms. And so this could be a, this could be a big deal, uh, but we'll have to see. Uh, finally, uh, not finally, I guess, config experimental uh, is, has been set to Y. Uh, what that means is um, there was this option to make experimental uh, that you, people never knew whether they should make their options that they put into the current kernel uh, depend on config experimental or not. There was, it was always a very kind of loose judgment call uh, whether uh, something should be considered experimental, but now nothing is considered experimental. If, if an option is good enough to go into the Linux kernel, it's good enough to, and, it, and it's got an option to turn it on and off, then there's no point in having another flag to say, well, you can turn this on, but it's a little bit shakier than other stuff. Um, so the, the end goal here is uh, they're actually going to remove config experimental, all the, all the options that are dependent on the regular options. So that should be gone soon. Um, and make menu config now has save and load buttons. So 
you don't actually you can you can save and load uh, configurations without having to exit, um, which is kind of the more normal way that uh, programs manage their uh, persistent state. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, one other thing coming up. Next slide. One other thing coming up in 3.9 that I'm pretty excited about. I think it still has a couple of things to shake out, but um, it's the scripter-based GPIO. So, as you know, uh, the system on chips, SOCs, have lots of GPIOs, general purpose input output pins, and they can be grouped and they can be um, manipulated. Um, and up until now, it's always been, at least in the kernel level, it's always, or the SysFS level, it's been, um, it's been by number. Um, and this descriptor-based GPIO allows you to internally define a descriptor. Now, the descriptor itself is like a pointer to a structure. Uh, but one of the things that you, you can now look them up, or you can register names for individual GPIOs or groups of GPIOs, and so you can now look them up by name or by number. Um, it also allows for grouping GPIOs together so that you can do um, operations on all of them at once. And they will happen in a very rapid, you know, as fast as the kernel can, can do it for kind of atomic operations where the timing is very critical. Uh, so this could be possibly very useful for handling things like real-time issues. Um, if you're driving, uh, I saw an example on LWN.net. The guy was talking about uh, controlling a stepper motor and then how some of the signals needed to really happen uh, as, as close together as possible. Uh, anyway, there's a really good article on that. Not that. Um, then in Linux 3.10, which is brand new, uh, this, well, this is what we think is going to happen. Usually I qualify this. So Linux 3.10, the merge window, is closed now. Uh, we're in release candidate four, but uh, first couple weeks of May, uh, this is some of the stuff that went in that got pulled in from from all the different trees. So there's full tick lists, which I'll talk about. It's a power management thing. Uh, I'm to do with the, the, the CPU and the, the operations done on on the periodic tick. There's single Z image for ARM, um, and this is what I described. Uh, previously as uh, multi-platform support. So basically it's the, abil the ability to build a single kernel image, binary image, that can support uh, multiple platforms. So um, x86 is really the only architecture, uh, Intel architectures, well and AMD, the same, that architecture family, is the only platform uh, I believe that has had support for a single binary that covered a multitude of chips and generations of chips. Uh, I think you could run a 386 kernel binary on all kinds of, you know, all kinds of processors uh, because of the backward support of the processors. Well, in the embedded space, uh, things are quite different. Uh, often, it's the nature of the business to customize the software for the particular chip and to compile it that way. Well, as we see, um, ARM chips, in particular, get used on um, in devices that are much more like traditional desktops or laptops. That's getting used in tablets and phones. Uh, there is some value uh, to being able to have a single kernel image uh, that can be tested and verified, and then run on a variety of platforms, usually in the same kind of uh, SOC family. Uh, but anyway, there's been a lot of work done on this. So there's lots more platforms in 3.10 uh, that are supporting multi-platform kernels of single image. It's not done yet, though. Uh, in particular, there's a Samsung processor, the Exynos, uh, that uh, was the work was submitted for it and then pulled out at the last minute. Uh, Arn Bergman, who's kind of leading this work, uh, is shooting for uh, basically almost complete coverage by 3.12, so in about six months, uh, five months. Um, we should have pretty good coverage of the platforms that they're targeting for coverage. They're not targeting all of them, so they're not trying to get a, an ARM kernel that will run all the way from the, you know version 5 architecture all the way up through Cortex-A15. Uh, basically, they have kind of these... Uh, 
uh, equivalent sets of uh, processors that have very similar instruction sets and uh, similar platforms um, that it makes sense to run these on. Um, so that's that's pretty interesting work. Um, there's also multi-cluster power management, uh, and this this was there's a there's a really good article on this. It's kind of hard to describe, but basically it allows you to control uh, clusters of CPUs um, and have them go idle uh, either together or independently. No, let's see. Yeah, there is well, it's for power management of clusters, groups of CPUs, and this is kind of partial support for uh, big dot little power management. Um, later on in this presentation, I'll refer you to a talk that actually describes uh, some of these principles uh, very well. Um, anyway, next slide. Uh, the other kind of two things that caught my eye in the 3.10 merge window was support for multiple F trace buffers. So you can actually have two different traces going on at the same time. Um, so that's that's pretty nice. Um, and then also memory pressure control group support. So uh, this is related to um, it's related to some of the other work, the, the memory control group support. Uh, but this allows for notifications to user space if memory gets low. And this is actually this is something we've been uh, different forms of this have been attempted to be merged into the kernel for a long time. And Android has its own system for doing uh, out of memory notifications. Uh, but this is a pretty high granularity, uh, a lot of control available from user space in terms of configuring what processes are in the control groups and, and how they react, what they do when they get notifications. Uh, it's entirely up to user space. So, um, gives a lot of flexibility uh, for handling low memory pressure. And there's uh, been a lot of work in the kernel uh, on what are known as shrinkers. So and these are notifications to let uh, user space have an opportunity to uh, avoid out of memory conditions, reduce their own, the where the applications reduce their own memory footprint uh, on notification from the kernel. So there's more stuff there. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit more about this full tick list, uh, which I mentioned on the first uh, 3.10 slide. Um, so this is also uh, referred to as full dynamic tick. And basically what it consists of is that under some circumstances, some processors may, processors may run with no periodic ticks at all. So from the very first, from, from day one in the kernel, well, maybe, I don't know, I would have to go back and look, but from very, very early in the kernel, the kernel has always had a periodic tick. Uh, pretty much a modern operating system, uh, well, in the 90s, that, that was how you did scheduling, uh, is you, you there, are, there are things that have to happen on a regular basis inside the kernel. And for a long time, uh, the periodic tick was all we had. Uh, and you, you used to fire at 100 times a second or 1,000 times a second, depending on the, the frequency of the CPU or the config settings. Um, but then that was, it was realized that that was consuming a lot of cycles just, just to process that. And um, there was a previously added to the kernel was something called config no hertz that used a dynamic tick. So when the CPU went into an idle mode, it would calculate how long uh, until the next scheduled item, uh, next timer needed to fire. So it basically was looking at a pool of timers. Uh, there are all these timers set up for the scheduler and for the networking and the IO scheduler to tell the kernel when when do I need to look at stuff or when do I need to wake up and check the status of uh, the networking or or look at the scheduling of the processes. Um, well, when config no hertz is added, uh, it switched over to a dynamic system where those um, those intervals uh, were calculated together, and the next interval was chosen. And instead of just waiting the next one uh, hundredth of a second or one thousandth of a second and checking again, instead of kind of going a polling thing, it would act, it was actually a timed event. Um, but that was only available when the CPU 
is idle. So the new option, and, and this is brand new, is that there's now three modes. There's the old periodic, where you just have a regular heartbeat tick on all CPUs. Uh, you have idle mode, which is the same as config no hertz. And that is where if a CPU goes into idle, it will use a dynamic tick. And then the last one is the full mode, and that is where even if the CPU is not idle, even if it has a running process, it can go into a dynamic tick mode. And so it will, instead of doing a periodic tick, uh, it will actually calculate while the process is running, it'll, and when it receives a tick, it'll calculate how far it should wait until the next tick. There are a bunch of rules about about this, though. It's a brand new feature, and there are a lot of restrictions. Uh, the first is that the boot CPU, usually CPU zero, cannot be in full ticklets. So it, it can be in either periodic or idle, but it, it cannot be in full ticklets. If there's anything running on the boot CPU, um, it, it will be doing periodic interrupts. Uh, the other thing is the kind of major restriction and this is may sound a little bit weird, but it, um, the CPU cannot be tickless if it has more than one process running on it. So obviously, um, this this is kind of intended for multiprocessor systems, and it's for when a um, when you have like say you have three four processors in the system, you can take one of those processes processors, one of those CPUs and dedicate it and put a single real-time task on it. And on that processor with the one task running, you can set it to full. And you actually control this with um, SysFS and with some uh, boot time arguments. But uh, then what happens is that that real-time process won't get the any periodic uh, ticks. And currently, there's also a, a you cannot have less than one tick per second, uh, but that's a that's an implementation detail that probably will change. It probably will get rid of even the one tick per second. Um, but this is a really exciting feature, actually, and I think this does as much as anything in terms of uh, power management to reduce the amount of, of uh, CPU cycles that are spent uh, processing timer ticks. Um, so this is this is pretty interesting work. Okay, next slide. So this is my list of things to watch, uh, kind of kernel features that we are seeing worked on that may be interesting. Um, so in terms of Android features, I, I kind of watch Android features because I was work, worked on a project to get some of this stuff mainlined. And some of the things that are still working their way in, taking a long time, are Boltal ranges and the ARM FIQ code, which is being translated into a kernel debugger glue code. Um, I think I have some more on it, both how ranges later. I'll talk about those later. But uh, The other thing is big.little um, multiprocessor scheduling. Uh, so there's a lot of work to support uh, clusters of CPUs that have different capabilities and to schedule them differently. Um, so you can read some of these articles uh, on, on some of the big dot little scheduling. Also, the single Z image support on ARM, we're going to see over the next couple of releases uh, much more work to support multiple platforms with a single binary image. And then the support for transactional memory instructions. And this could be a really big deal. It's, too, it's kind of too early to tell, but this could be a really big, important thing to simplify uh, the locking and the synchronization primitives for um, multi-core systems. Um, and it could be the type of thing that we just take for granted in about in 10 or 20 years. But right now, nobody has transactional memory. It's all kind of researchy and expensive. But uh, once it gets built into commodity processors, um, this, this could have a big impact on the way we write things. Uh, the other thing, next slide. The other thing, which is much longer term, uh, and this always comes up, is everybody has been looking forward to non-volatile mass memory. Um, and so there's always a little bit of non-volatile RAM or, uh, sitting around in the system, or there's not always, but there's 
it's often the case that there's non-volatile memory sitting around in the system. And uh, there were, I thought there were some really interesting remarks uh, by Linus Torvalds at LinuxCon uh, during the question and answer period. First, uh, he's always skeptical that it will happen anytime soon. People have been talking about this, uh, this non-volatile ma mass memory. Uh, and uh, what I'm talking about here is things like uh, MRAM, uh, magneto-resistive uh, random access memory, uh, or the phase chain RAM, uh, PC RAM. Uh, so it's byte addressable RAM, uh, persistent storage that is as fast as regular RAM and does not cost does not uh, cost a lot more to write uh, than to read in terms of speed and power. Well, these things, um, anyway, Linus said that he's skeptical that it will happen because he's been hearing about it for years. I actually looked back and uh, we had some papers about people doing, we had talks in 2006, I think, uh, from people doing uh, PRAM, PCRAM systems uh, with the kernel at, at a Linux conference. And so that's been, uh, what, six or seven years ago. Um, so it may or may not happen, uh, but we'll see. Uh, but I thought Linus's remarks were very interesting. He said this won't change a lot of kernel algorithms. People were saying, well, isn't this going to shake up things if you don't have to store stuff in a file system? And he basically said, well, you will store stuff in a file system. One, but the applications won't get rewritten overnight. Uh, the applications will will still be written the way they are, and there's a, you know 40 years of legacy applications, so it'll take a long time before this trickles up. But he thinks the biggest change will really be in the file systems. So the, there may be some kernel algorithms that change in the way it stores and the way it boots, particularly that take advantage of the fact that memory doesn't go away between boots. Uh, but the but byte addressable storage really does have big implications for long-term storage. For years and years and years, basically since this is the advent of the floppy disk or the hard drive, we've been dealing with block-based storage. Um, and so we've always tried to coalesce things into blocks and organize things as blocks. And if it's byte addressable and persistent, that could fundamentally change the way we think about file systems. So that is uh, something that's really interesting. But it's, it's, a, it's a long ways off. And uh, Linus made the point that applications will still need to separate and segregate data between persistent and non-persistent groups. So there'll still be different categories of data. Uh, you don't really want um, the cache of your browser to stay around. You want that memory reutilized or reused first. And so there's going to be categories, even, even if all of the memory is persistent, you're going to be designated cert certain pieces of data and certain areas of memory to be long-lived and some to be short-lived. Um, and things take longer to change than people think. So first we need to see the, this is a chicken and egg problem. Uh, we need to see the devices, and then we'll have the software support, the kernel offering system support for it, and then it'll take a long time for apps to change and all that. So this, this type of change will take a really long time, so it won't happen super quick. But that's something to watch. It's interesting. Okay, so let me now go through technology areas. And I probably have talked about some of these already. Uh, in, for this presentation, uh, I don't have much new stuff to talk about boot up time. Uh, I did, uh, we haven't had a, a conference between when I last gave this at Japan Jamboree 44 and this one in there. At LinuxCon Japan, I didn't see anyone talking about boot up time. So n not much new stuff this time. And the next slide, not much new stuff about graphics. Graphics is about, it's kind of rolling along uh, like it has been. No no real big announcements. Some, some activity on Wayland and its adoption in Tizen, but, uh, but that, not really earth shattering. Wayland's been around for a while and it looks interesting. Um, okay, so uh, file systems. So the big news in file systems is F2FS, uh, at least for, for embedded. 
So this was mainlined in Linux version 3.8. That's developed by Samsung. Uh, it's log structured uh, with lots of tweaks. Um, and uh, I put a whole bunch of resources online on the elinux.org website. Uh, some, one of the big features I'll just highlight is hot versus cold data separation. Uh, it opens multiple logs simultaneously. So a lot of log structured file systems just have one or two logs. Uh, F2FS actually has six logs. And I think it's configurable. So they actually kind of try and match the geometry of the uh, EMMC device or the flash device. Um, and flash devices are getting a lot more complicated. They actually are running essentially their own little mini uh, real-time operating system internally to control the, the algorithms, the flash translation layer. And so the, the goal of F2FS is to try and take advantage of uh, how the flash memory is laid out and how it operates and to uh, create a file system that is friendlier to that. And they've done a pretty good job. If you look at the, the paper uh, or the presentation by Ju Young Huang, uh, you, can, you can find that there's links from, from that page. Um, uh, they've gotten pretty good random write performance. That's, that's been the real performance problem on flash devices is random writes. Um, and they've uh, made some good progress. The other thing is that the CE work group actually did a project to analyze file system performance on EMMC, and I'll talk about that, uh, I think, on the next slide. Next. Yep. Okay. So we, we contracted with a company called Cogent Embedded, and the goal was to test different block based file systems on Flash Media. Uh, specifically, we wanted to measure the effect of different tuning options. So inside the kernel, you can you can do things like pick a different uh, I/O scheduler, or you can specify the flash geometry, which is how many erase blocks it has, how large the erase blocks are, uh, and then compare that if you did it with different flash parts um, and with different workload characteristics, size of reads, and whether they're ser sequential reads and writes or random reads and writes. So I'm very happy to announce, and this is my first official announcement, that the document is now available. It has been uploaded to the elinux.org website. It's the 1.0 version of the document. And if you follow that link, you can go download that document and give it to the file system guys in your company and tell them to use the information. Uh, this, is, this is what we do in the CE work group, is try to, try to provide useful data and uh, technology for companies to enhance their use of Linux. So there you go. The document's finally available. It's, it took uh, almost a full year to, to write the document. And uh, the good thing about the document is that it has not just the, the results data, but it has a whole section on the methodology, how they did the testing, what types of things they tested. And, uh, and so I think it's pretty useful. Okay, next slide. Okay, now on to power management. Um, so honestly, I've talked about this one before, but this is basically, this is Wake Box uh, that was re-engineered uh, multiple times and finally put into a way that was, that was accepted into version 3.5. Um, and then the other thing is power aware scheduling. And uh, this is not exactly the same thing. So big.little is a form of power aware scheduling, um, I suppose it's it's in the purpose of big dot little scheduling is to is to reduce power consumption, but power aware scheduling adds some extra attributes uh, to the tasks to indicate the power levels and and things, and so uh, that is something that is going on and is actively being developed. Uh, this is by no means a done. Uh, this code is not done. Um, next slide. So big dot little scheduling uh, has been doing lots of lots of work, and I already talked about this a bit. So there's the multi-cluster power scheduling, uh, which is really scheduling um, clusters of CPUs together. Uh, there's the internal switcher work, which is also related to to this work. Uh, I thought one of the best descriptions of all of these different systems 
was there was a talk at LinuxCon Japan uh, by Nakagawa-san, uh, Rina Sas, and they talked about uh, an alternate approach. So it turned, and there's the title of the talk. You can go look at it on the presentations uh, for LinuxCon Japan. Uh, it's up there. Um, basically, uh, the Rina Sas approach is to do some stuff in user space. Uh, it's taking a long time for this stuff to develop inside the mainline kernel. Uh, because you don't change the scheduler of the mainline kernel um, very easily. It's it's very people are very 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 careful when they change the scheduler because there's a lot of systems that the, whose performance is is tied to how things get scheduled, and so um, and so the work to support to change the scheduling for big dot little is going very very slowly. I thought that the approach taken by Renesas was very interesting and useful currently, useful in current kernels, which um, can take advantage of some of the big dot little concepts and principles uh, without having to wait until uh, all of this stuff gets up all the way into mainline. So I, I am, however, and maybe someone there knows, I don't know if um, Unicasasan is there, but uh, maybe someone knows if we have ever seen real product results. I don't know if any. Uh, and I think one of the Samsung phones is shipping with a big little configuration. Uh, so I don't know if we've actually gotten real data results from, from this stuff yet for, with, with live workloads. There's a lot of people testing simulated workloads, or, or, uh, but out in the field, workloads is a little bit different. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what the final results are going to be. Okay, it's, it's, it's just for information, but today, Nakamasa will predict the real. Uh, oh, yeah, you're gonna get that talk. Yeah, oh, okay, that's great. Okay, you guys will get it all. Yeah. In Japanese. <laughs> In Japanese. Right. Well, that's even better. <laughs> so, that's what you okay. Um, then system size. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about kernel size and library size. I just realized I'm gonna go over my time slot here, so I better speed up a little bit. Um, I'll try not to talk too fast, though. So uh, kernel size. Uh, the big thing recently is cooperative memory relinquishment. Actually, this is not, uh, I, I categorize this wrong. This is about user space. Uh, because this is about user space uh, relinquishing uh, mechanisms for user space to relinquish memory ranges. So the kernel provides the feature of volatile ranges, or in the Lexmark's works, it was something called MemBroker. Um, but the, this is about processes being able to um, cooperatively yield memory back to the system. Uh, and that is a big topic. Uh, that's, for years we've talked about doing this, and it's really, really nice to see these algorithms actually start getting implemented in the kernel to support this behavior up in, up in user space. Um, and then I'll throw a little blurb out there. So I did my presentation on advanced size optimization I think that was the only size talk at LinuxCon Japan. And I gave it too fast. I, I Anyway, but my slides are out there. You can go look at my slides. Uh, actually, my, the next slide? I don't know. I'll, I'll talk about my talk in a second. Okay, but so the other thing that's going on is up in user space, uh, there are a lot of efforts to try and reduce libraries. Uh, so um, it, in non-Android systems, Android systems are getting bigger and bigger, and they don't, the size of the library is the least of your problems. But for kind of more traditional, deeply embedded things, people still care about the size of things. And so um, there's this OLIBC, which is taking Bionic LIBC and uh, trying to use it for kind of more traditional embedded Linux. And you can see they've got it down to 244K, or yeah, 244K, which is just really, really small. And I rec highly recommend you look at that talk by Jim Huang uh, to see about that. And then there's also the ability to configure even uh, glibc to make it much more granular. Um, and same thing there, there's talk by Kim Raj uh, about uh, some of the kconfig work. I think this is all available in, in Yocto, so you can actually choose the individual pieces of glibc that you want to use. So there's a library reduction. Okay, then this is this is what I talked about was um, 
finding automatic ways to reduce the kernel size. And I, I don't have time to give my whole talk, but I looked at a couple of different things. Uh, really big one is link time optimization. I really hope this gets mainlined. I did some work on it. I've described this before, but you can look at my presentation and see some of the numbers I got. Uh, if you can get the right compiler and uh, right tool chain configured, compiler and, and bin utils, uh, it's really easy to apply these patches and get yourself a big, uh, a big reduction in kernel size. And I still haven't gotten the performance numbers, but I think the performance will be good also. And then I also looked at things like eliminating unused system calls, uh, doing kernel command line argument elimination, and adding a full constraint system uh, to automatically go through the kernel and eliminate unused data and unused functions. Um, and all of this is written up in my, in my paper, and you can follow the link. Then additional research, which I didn't do myself, but which I found, uh, had to do with uh, rewriting the kernel at link time and uh, cold code compression. So taking code that was found to be unused uh, in the kernel and compressing it, uh, and then actually on the fly decompressing it if it ever did get called. Uh, and, uh, and some of the research results on the 2.4 kernel, uh, this was found to have a pretty big effect on the total size. Uh, up to 20, 23%, somewhere in that range. Um, okay, so security. The other thing happening, and I was surprised, for years and years we haven't seen anything going on with security and embedded, but um, obviously this is an important topic, uh, especially as Linux is getting into safety critical session, uh, safety critical um, devices like cars, uh, and uh, and into mass market products that are that are um, very attractive targets, mobile phones and TV sets. Um, so I'm actually a little bit surprised it's taken this long. But finally, security is starting to get really seriously looked at in the embedded space. And the two uh, two areas are SMAC and SE Linux. So we'll talk about those real quick. So um, SMAC just just uh, yesterday. Uh, there was a really good article about SMAC uh, developed for Tizen. So Tizen has adopted SMAC as its uh, security system. SMAC uh, stands for Simple Mandatory Access Control Kernel. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very nice, simple system. It's much simpler than uh, SE Linux in terms of how it operates. Uh, but uh, some developers went in, come up, came up with a simplified rule set to try to address uh, embedded products needs. Uh, so not, not a rule set for uh, the desktop, but a rule set for embedded. And they came up with basically three tiers and 40,000 rules. That sounds like a lot, uh, but, um, but it's, actually, it's actually not that bad if you compare it to a desktop. SE Linux system will have on the order of 900,000 rules. Uh, so this is only 40,000 rules. Uh, but anyway, so this is really interesting uh, as a new security, mandatory access control security system for, for Tizen. On the next slide, uh, this, this totally uh, surprised me uh, that Android has actually adopted SE Linux. Um, so I thought for many years uh, that SE Linux was too big to be used in embedded. Well, Android is being used now on systems that are fairly big. Um, I have a phone in front of me that has two gig of memory, and it's running, you know, a, a multi-core, several gigahertz processor. Uh, um, but so, on that one, uh, the overhead is not nearly the issue. So the early embedded SE Linux required like two meg of memory, and the desktop uh, SE rule set is like 900,000 rules. Was, which I still think is too big for embedded. But people went to work on it, uh, the guys that, uh, that work on SE Linux, and came up with a specific SE Android uh, that has only 16, 1,658 rules and only 263 different types uh, for a total policy size of only 71K. And so, and their overhead is really low. There's a really good uh, 
highly recommend the paper at the bottom there. But there's a whole page you can go look at some of the uh, interesting information about it. And they actually talk about some of the exploits that um, SE Linux uh, prevents. Some of the uh, kind of the high profile Android exploits could have been prevented uh, with SE Linux in place. And it looks like it's in. Um, I think Jelly Bean 4.2, 4.1 or 4.2 actually has this in place. But the, then the carriers have to turn it on. And I don't know if, if they're doing that yet. But, but this is really interesting. Uh, so in terms of CU workgroup, OK, yeah, tracing. Uh, last thing on tracing. So we have, um, and I just saw this. I had not heard of this, but I saw this at LinuxCon Japan. And I was just really interested in it. And this was uh, KTAP, which is dynamic tracing uh, without the overhead of compiling into a module. So uh, system tap. Uh, is um, a tracing system that allows you to take a trace script, uh, compile it into a module, and inject it into a running kernel. But that is a very complicated system. It was intended to be um, kind of a competitor, or a, not a competitor, but a, um, to have the same functionality and features as uh, DTrace on Solaris. DTrace was very, very highly regarded and very widely used on Solaris, and Linux did not have a comparable trace, tracing system. Uh, but this, this takes kind of a middle-of-the-road approach. So it adds an interpreter to the kernel, um, which is often frowned upon. But it's a single module, uh, and it, so you do not actually have to compile something into a module to inject it into the kernel. Uh, so this, that single module leverages ftrace and kprobes, and uh, the results come out in ASCII. Uh, but there was a really, really good session on this, uh, get the details on it, um, by uh, Joby uh, Zhang. And I think uh, he works for Huawei. Uh, but that was a good session at LinuxCon Japan. The slides are online. I really, really hope that this gets mainlined, because I would like to use it. In fact, I am looking at, uh, I'm going to talk to uh, the people I work for now and see if I can convince them to put it into our kernels. Um, for just our day-to-day -day development work. I think it's really useful. OK, next. OK, so CE Workgroup Project, next slide. So uh, the CE Workgroup, I'll be honest with you, we have kind of stalled out. We do not have our contract work projects lined up for 2013. Um, the two I wanted to highlight in this talk were dynamic memory analysis that was completed in 2012 but I think the results are important enough to kind of highlight. And then the EMCC tuning guide, EMMC tuning guide, uh, that I already talked about. And actually, so I think in the interest of time, I think we can skip over those. So we'll just go dynamic memory analysis. We had, we did all this work. Up, well, I'm not going to skip it completely. I'll, I'll give a little short blurb. We did all this work to instrument the kernel and to write a new tool to visualize the memory usage. And on the next slide, you can see uh, next slide. Yeah, you can see the visualization. It allows you to visualize uh, the actual dynamic allocations. So there's a lot of tools that will show you how much memory is being used statically uh, by different kernel areas. But this shows you by area how much is used dynamically, uh, which is pretty interesting. And then the next slide, uh, it actually shows kind of with a ring chart, breaks it up. Uh, to show you um, a more detailed view. So if you look at the upper right hand part, of, or the upper left hand part of the diagram, which is the blue portion, um, you see that SysFS is, uh, or all file systems are taking 64K, and SysFS is 20K, and ProcFS is 20K. So for each kind of major subsystem area of the kernel, uh, in the green area, drivers is taking 173K. Um, it shows you, you know, it broken out where the memory is going. So it allows you to visualize. It's pretty nice. So go check out that tool. Um, and then the next thing is the EMC tuning guide, and I already talked about that, so we can skip that. Go, go download the document. It's great stuff. Okay. Then the other project that the CE workgroup has got going on is the uh, long-term support initiative, and there are lots of presentations on this. It's available now. Uh, we did hold a workshop at LinuxCon Japan. 
Uh, and we discussed some new things. So the program exists, it's going. Uh, we're very anxious to make sure people know about it and can use it. Um, so we've been talking more, more about kind of the next phase, uh, and that is promotion and testing. Um, let's see, yeah, right there. So we do have this program to get free hardware, and we recently approved in the CE workgroup some more funding for that program. Uh, is someone talking about LTSI today? Yes, um, Lama San is going to talk something about it. Maybe okay, so I'm happen. sure he's going to he's going to tell you about the uh, the free hardware that you can get. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll skip that. Um, okay, so let's skip this page, the hardware page. Um, you go to other stuff. Just real quickly, I'll go over tools, build systems, events, miscellaneous. Okay. So tools. Um, Tools are really important. Uh, I continue to be interested in kind of crash dump tools, and, and uh, I saw this one at ELC 2013 that generates a sparse core dump. Uh, it's a core dump filter program. Uh, so that's something that's been string. There was a really good uh, overview of kernel debugging techniques by Kevin Dankwart. Uh, and uh, so that's good as kind of a basic introduction. A lot of us is have done these techniques for years, but uh, it's good if you're just getting into it to learn how to, how to debug uh, the kernel in particular. Uh, next thing, uh, there's a lot of testing frameworks out there. There's kind of no single, especially in the embedded space, there's no single framework that is um, that you can use for everything that's, that's comprehensive enough to use for everything. A lot of the testing frameworks that are really, really nice are not cross-compiler aware. Uh, that's true of AutoTest, which is one of the nice kernel testing frameworks. Lava looks like it's pretty good. Um, we're in the process of discussing for LTSI what type of uh, test framework we would want to have uh, for that. There was a BOF on this at uh, ELC 2013, uh, kernel testing tools and techniques. Anyway, inside the CE workgroup, we're consider, considering reviving some kind of test activity, probably with LTSI, uh, but we could really use some input. So if you're on CE Linux dash dev, if you see us start to discuss this, please, please uh, give us your input uh, so we can uh, do some good stuff. Um, let's see, build systems, Yocto project, uh, still going strong, doing great. Build root is also doing well. Uh, presentations on both of these were at the last uh, Embedded Linux conference. Uh, next slide. Ah, distributions. Distributions has changed a bit. I, you know, I was kind of, I was really impressed with the Tizen stuff at LinuxCon Japan. Um, you know, uh, Tizen is kind of the, re the successor to Migo, which was the successor to some earlier projects. Uh, but it's looking like a pretty serious competitor as a major embedded distro. Um, I think it needs to open up a bit in terms of how it, it accepts contributions. Uh, that is, it seems to be happening though. Uh, what really struck me is that it actually is replacing Bata at Samsung. So Samsung had its own internal uh, distribution of Linux called Bata, and they're serious about uh, having Tizen. I believe, uh, I thought I saw an announcement about Tizen actually shipping in phones. Um, but anyway, so that's, I think it's a, I think it's something to follow now. I, I was kind of ignoring it for a while because I thought, oh, you know, another, another embedded distro. But I think it's, uh, I think it's a serious distro to pay attention to and to, to maybe start promoting and using. Um, maybe it will be the one true embedded distro uh, besides Android, of course. We've got Android. Uh, the, uh, the, what you see, what we saw at Android Builders. Summit this year is people still talking about using Android in non-CE embedded devices. Of course, people are using it in phones and tablets, but um, but it's also uh, got an interesting an interesting capability to be used other places in industrial automation and and kiosks and things like that, um, and even in headless operation. Uh, the Octo project I think has become the new in-house distro. Uh, a lot of people have adopted this. Um, it's really good for making that special custom distro for whatever you're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, it used to be people would roll their own operating system. Well, now you don't roll your own operating system because 
because Linux is around. But you do want to roll your own distro. And then Angstrom is very is out there and is, is uh, very, very common to see. And it's kind of the, the distro that's released on development boards. So there's it's, uh, lots and lots of distributions available. So it's a great time to be an embedded Linux developer, except for all the choices you have to make. Um, then events. Here's the events coming up. Uh, well, LinuxCon Japan just finished, um, and you're getting you're going to see some of the results from that. We've got the Japan Jamborees. LinuxCon US is coming up in September, and then uh, I want to put a plug in for Embedded Linux Conference Europe coming up in Scotland this year, October 21 through the 23rd, and uh, we are quite excited about that. Um, we are getting proposals for that now, so we don't. We don't know what we're going to see yet, but we know it's going to be great. Uh, and then next year in April, we're shifting to April, we'll have Embedded Linux Conference. Uh, that is the wrong year there, April. It's April 2014. And this year it will be in San Jose, not San Francisco. So, um, uh, And then the eLinux Wiki. You should go out and read stuff on the eLinux Wiki. A lot of great stuff out there. Uh, I pushed. I have links in this presentation to some of the places that I've put information recently. You can go look at that, and uh, other people are putting stuff up there as well. Next slide. Uh, just finally, kind of wrap up, the status of the industry, very, very healthy. Um, by my calculations, and they are very, very crude, they're primitive, but over 1.4 billion devices have shipped with embedded Linux, and I think that's conservative. Um, we know at least 900 million Android devices, and I think at least a half a billion other devices, at least. Uh, hundreds of millions of products have shipped. Routers, TVs, embedded Linux is really everywhere. We just had the self 10th anniversary party. It was really great to, to uh, get together and reminisce. Uh, things are still growing strong. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I just got a new job at Sony. Um, I'm going to be working a lot more with cell phones. I'm as excited as ever about the uh, embedded industry, about embedded Linux, and about continuing to work uh, in this great field. It's super fun. Anyway, um, I'll point you, as usual, to some resources. Uh, the last one, especially on the bottom there, uh, the LinuxCon Japan slides, a lot of them, I think almost all of them are online now, so uh, go out and take a look at those. And uh, with that, I will thank you for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you very much, Tim. And just uh, before your presentation start, uh, Kobayasan, uh, the Kyoto Maikon, uh, proposed us one uh, quite uh, interesting uh, proposal. We should look at the, you know, uh, our uh, specification, which was written, written, written about uh, 10 years ago, and review what all those kind of you know specifications became right now becomes right now, and we are quite excited to see what actually happened within ten years. What do you think about it? Oh yeah, no, I I have not done that formally, mm -hmm. but I have I, I was like the lead editor on on a lot of the specifications, and so I remember some of the major features, and uh, I have a really hard time thinking of a feature now that we wanted that we don't have. Yeah. And, and in fact, and we have a lot of new interesting areas. There were features that, that we didn't put in those documents because we knew they were kind of far out, and, and but that we do have now. Yeah. It, so it's pretty exciting. We really have made a lot of progress. Okay. I, that's a good idea, though. I should go back and actually kind of yeah. check off. I'm also excited about that idea, so that I'd, I'd like to make some sort of contribution. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, any questions here? Who are coming? Ah, no. Japanese, ah, no. 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 